Welcome to Greatest Scene Ever, where we present some of the greatest film scenes of all time. Today, under the lights, we'll spotlight one of our own, a professor in the film department who's been twice honored with Oscars by the, Amer by the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences for Best Achievement in Sound, Russell Williams. We'll talk with Professor Williams about the many films he's been a part of over the course of 35 years in the business. Now, these are some of Hollywood's biggest box office successes and most notable films, including Trading Day, Some of All Fears, Waiting to Exhale, and Mo Money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so sit back and, uh, and join us for a special hour-long Greatest Scene Ever as we proudly present the films of Russell Williams. Hello everyone and welcome to Greatest Scene Ever. We have a new set today. Many thanks to all who helped out in designing and building it with a special shout out to Megan Rahm and Austin Bird of the AU Theater Department. Thank you guys. And we're very excited to have as our special guest today a professor in the AU Film Department and one of the consummate film sound professionals in the business, our friend Russell Williams. Russell? There he is. <laughs> a little golf clap. Can you get a golf clap from the crew, please? <laughs> Thank you for coming by. My pleasure. I know, you were in the neighborhood, right? <laughs> I wouldn't call Mo Money one of the more significant films in film history. Well, we'll get to that. Not, uh, this, is, this, is, this is one, this is a, here, have a seat. And this this is a momentous event in, in film sound history. I'm wiring him up for once. Okay, so we're going to get this to you. You can stick that in your pocket. Okay. That could be a whole game name. How many, how many Russell Williams films can you? Ooh, that's right, that's right. Oh, I, I'm going to get to some of this. I found some obscure ones, which I didn't even know existed. But, uh, and, and, and thanks to IMDb, they pull up all that stuff that you right. would never want anybody to see on your resume. <laughs> it's all Russell Williams with them. Like, yeah, I needed to pay the rent. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you, before we get into our first clip, can I, can I uh, just uh, run a, a couple of quick things by you? Um, you've been here for nine years now yes. at AU. Um, what is it uh, that brought you to academia? and uh, brought into the university and off the film set. You know, people uh, have asked me this question, you're teaching now, why did you leave the film sets? That must have been so great. And I have my own reasons, but I'm, I'm curious as to why, why you made the jump. Greg and uh, Paul, uh, first of all, Dean Kirkman came to Los Angeles with the then development director and just talked to a few AU alums and asked, would, be, would we be interested in c contributing to the curriculum? Mm -hmm. But I think he had in mind just sending you know, PowerPoint every now and then, or Skyping in. Well, Skype wasn't even really u in use then. I said, well, I'd rather come to campus and be part of the faculty. Uh, reason number two, my dad was pretty ill back then. He's still with us, thank God, he's 89. He's here so in town? In he's DC? in town, uh, well, just outside uh, in Camp Springs, Maryland. And then uh, number three, most of the work that I really loved to do was being outsourced. It was going to Canada, and there wasn't really a lot of new exciting things that I wanted to do below the line in film. I was tired of sitting around the set for 12 or 15 hours waiting for a director to make a decision. So No business like show business. No right? business like show business. <laughs> and people think of the glamour of show business, but that's only on Oscar night, Emmy night, right. Grammy night, right. et cetera. When you see 5,000 head of buffalo running past you on the prairie, that's terror. Because right, if they right. decide to make a right turn, you're right there. When you see these guys fighting in the alley and training day, where they, you see these guys standing in the mud in glory, we're standing in the mud too. You know, I was a lot younger when I went to L.A. After you cross the 50 mark, you start, you know, people actually make money sitting behind a desk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. And those, those shots you see require, you know, 10 hours of, of lighting and... And, uh, well, preparing it, and and, all and, and depending things. on the complexity of the shot, I think yeah. one of the worst setups I ever worked on. Did you mention waiting to exhale in your intro? I did. There was a shot in waiting to exhale where we have one actor sleeping on the bed. She wakes up, picks up the phone. It took eight hours to light that. Is that right? Now why? Yeah. No. Yeah. But that's when I started to yeah. think maybe there's something else I can do for a living. Yeah, there's there's a famous there's a famous line if I can bring in a music parallel here about uh, it's from Ringo Starr yes. where he talks about during the White Album when the band was sort of splintering they were all doing their other things and Ringo would be brought in he'd play his one track and then he would sit for days <laughs> and Ringo's line about the White he said I remember the White Album and forgive me if I'm getting the album wrong someone can check me on this but he said I, I I remember the White Album because that's the album that I learned to play chess on <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of feel that way about sound stuff but we should get to our first clip actually yeah. before we run out of time here so let's get right down to it yep. Yeah, um, 
So the first clip we have is from a 1989 film about the uh, Fighting 54th Regiment, which is uh, an all-black um, regiment in the Union Army in the Civil War, um, Glory. And let's take a look. We ready, kind of. Okie dokie. Well, welcome back to uh, Greatest Scene Ever. Um, what we're going to do, uh, Russell, we're going to take a quick break here, and um, then we're going to come back and talk about okay. Glory. So stick with us. Greatest Scene Ever. We'll be back in a moment. Oh, my God. Uh, it's very hard to say. I... The Greatest Scene Ever comes from Zulu which is one of my favorite films. Just the part where he starts walking up to the door and it's a slow, great first person shot and it's really, really emotional. It's just creepy. There's all sorts of dead animals behind Norman Bates. Martin Sheen's character has a very intense, personal, like interior monologue. I don't think anything had taken the wind out of my lungs like that uh, scene. It's horrifying, but at the same time electrifying and inspiring. It's enough to bring the hairs up on your spine. A great, great scene. A brilliant scene. It's the greatest scene. Hello, welcome back to Greatest Scene Ever, the show that explains the mechanics of good cinema. Today we're looking at both the films uh, of Oscar-winning Professor Russell Williams and later your personal pick for greatest scene ever. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about Glory before we go too far. Um, and I want to just make a quick explanation as to, uh, for our viewers out there who um, uh, don't know, there are sort of two versions of, uh, of, of sound on a set on, in, in filmmaking. There's the people who are on the set, which is called location sound. They work with Karen. That's you. I've done that as well. And we've also both, I think, worked. You also worked in post, haven't you? A little bit. A little bit, but, yeah. yeah. But essentially, uh, there are people on sound who record whatever the camera shoots. And then they turn it over to these people with uh, no tans who sit in tiny little rooms and um, um, work on sound and put all the stuff together. So you're primarily a location sound person. And former. I want, for, well, former, right, right. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, specifically about Glory, because okay. the scene that we saw, um, we're outside, sand, stuff. Talk a little bit about the challenges for you know, doing that scene. Well, Greg and, and, and Paul, it's very difficult to be on location and find something that I would call a pristine sound environment. Uh, we may see some clips later from Dances with Wolves. That was absolutely pristine, and we'll get to that later. Uh, most of what we saw in that scene was shot on Jekyll Island in Georgia. Uh, the only real problems that weren't part of the 19th century, which is where the story mm -hmm. took place, was every now and then we would hear a helicopter of the present day U.S. Army flying over. but. Your, your real job is to try to get the dialogue as isolated as possible mm -hmm. with as little noise, uh, little 
interference from outside the zone of safety, in other words, outside the camera zone, do we hear trucks, do we hear motorcycles, do we hear anything that mm -hmm. tells you you're not in the 19th century in that particular clip? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I want to jump to our other clip because we, we've looked at glory, and I have to say, Russell, 1989 was a hell of a year for you. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little busy. <laughs> you were a little busy that year. You uh, also worked on a, a, a little uh, film, Kevin Costner's Field of Dreams. So let's take a look at that, and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay. So here's Field of Dreams. Bye. What? <laughs> what are you grinning at, you ghost? If you build it, he will come. I saw him years later when he was worn down by life. Look at him. He's got his whole life in front of him, and I'm not even a glint in his eye. What do I say to him? Why don't you introduce him to his granddaughter? Hi. Hi. I just wanted to thank you folks for putting up this field and letting us play here. I'm John Kinsella. I'm Ray. My wife, Annie. This is my daughter, Karen. Karen, this is my... This is John. Hi, John. Hiya, Karen. Well, um, you know, in the in the last two clips and, and the one that's coming up, I think uh, one of the things that you did very masterfully is um, hide the uh, the microphones, especially in these long shots, um, mm -hmm. because as the camera pulls away, you can't stick, you can't have a microphone sitting there and, and picking up the voices. And um, you know, the the three films that the the two we've talked about and the one that's coming up all have these sh shots in these wide open spaces and fields. And, uh, you know, um, it's, it's a real skill that, that you mastered that I think a lot of, you know, location sound people, um, you know, would, uh, would do well to, to study what you've done, so. Well, well thank you, Paul. One of, the, one of the reasons that I think I was able to try to capture the essence of the, the distance and still maintain intelligibility and the quality of the voices is because one of the things I would do when I was just a puppy out in Los Angeles was even though I was working on these really tiny movies that nobody should have know about, <laughs> I would still try to go to the post-production mix and get feedback from the people who worked on it and said, you know, you could have done this, you could have done that. In Field of Dreams, there are a few scenes where I actually planted microphones on the ball field. Mm -hmm. to get those really, really long shots because in one of my classes I said is you only have to be one-third the distance back from camera to get the full perspective. Uh, the other thing is you have to have a good boom operator. In other words, we know that so the, the guy camera's... That holds the, the pole right. up on the set like that. We know the shot's pulling back, and so that means that he or she has to lift up and still stay in the sweet spot on the actor speaking. 
And it also helps that you have a quiet environment to work with, which we, we were pretty quiet in Iowa, even though we did hear uh, noise from the adjacent farms every now and then, mostly on night shots, though. And, and uh, these weren't done with, these shots weren't done with wireless microphones? No, uh, there's, there's probably one shot in Field of Dreams that uses a wireless. There are two shots in Glory. There's, there are absolutely zero shots in Dance with Wolves where I use a wireless. I, I loathe wireless mics except when that's the only res you know, that's the only option to hear anything. See, that's the funny thing because most people uh, who uh, you know think about sound, they would think uh, location sound be so easy to just put a mic on them, and they and we're all wearing mics here too. Right. We all have our little hidden mics microphones here right. as well. But. Um, uh, you know, it'd be so easy just to put a little radio mic in the back of them like that, but you don't like them. And, and I, I'm not a big fan either, but tell me, tell me why you, you don't like radio well, mics. Well, you know, the thing that, first of all, if you just look at the dollars and cents, the money in the wireless mic is really in the transmitter receiver. Mm -hmm. The microphone, which I have an example on myself, mm -hmm. is, is probably $200. Whereas the microphones that we use on the end of a fishpole are $1,000, $2,000 microphones. They, they're built by the best microphone companies in the world, like Neumann and Sheps. Mm -hmm. And they also give you a more realistic interpretation of the voice. The voice is really three components. It's what's here, it's what's here, and it's what's here. Mm -hmm. So the mic out in front of you gets all three of those. Mm -hmm. But the Downfall is, of course, if you're in a noisy location, then the noise is probably more prominent than what you want to hear. So that's when you are kind of forced to go to a microphone that's actually sitting on somebody's chest. Yeah, and, and also the, it's the size of the microphone is so large that you have Absolutely. To I mean, the larger your diaphragm of the microphone, in other words, if you've got a microphone that size, this size is going to be better. This size is really going to be great, you know. Yeah. So it's the same way with speakers, you know. The, exactly. the same is true on the opposite side. Okay. Well, uh, I, I guess that's, that's it. So now it's time for the quiz. Ah, I think. Um, yeah. So uh, we're talking about another one of your films, um, Dancers with Wolves. Mm -hmm. So in Dancers with Wolves, uh, what was the name of the tribe of Native Americans? Uh, was it Apache, B, Mohican, C, Sioux? So go to our website and check on the trivia link and register your answer. Okie dokie. We'll be right back with more Greatest Scenes Ever after this. adrenaline fueled thrill ride but there's no way you could perpetrate that amount of carnage and mayhem and not incur a considerable amount of paperwork that is nothing man this is about to go off but which one of us welcome scenes? back to greatest scene ever <laughs> we're joined on the set today by <laughs> au film professor and academy award winner russell williams uh, russell. two times two times time. what did i say academy award winner okay yeah, there's yeah, an yeah. s on the end of winners yes that's right <laughs> And, uh, you know, you didn't bring your Oscars today. I should say that, you know, up here on the set, if this makes you feel better, you can just hold one of my fake ones. You know, my my like dad that. has the Oscars. Does when, he? When I, when I went to the Oscars this year, yeah. uh, he said, well, what about the statuettes? I said, what about them? He said, well, are, you, you, are they safe at home? I said, oh, I get it. So I, <laughs> he's been taking pictures with his friends. Yeah, I was going to say, Oscars. yeah, yeah I'll hold on to those for I you. didn't have the heart Stuff to go like get that. them back and, from him. So. Oh, that's very You should also say that, that you also have two Emmys in addition. Two primetime Emmys, right. Yes, exactly. Which are in my office anytime you want to yeah. come see them. They're actually. Those are pretty big. Right. The, the right. base <laughs> of those are <laughs> like that. Well, Paul and Russell, our next clip um, won Russell here. His second Oscar for film sound. Was this the first one? Was Dances the first one or the second one? It was the second. The second, that's what I thought. Okay. So I was right. That's, and it, this also won Best Picture of 1990. Dances with Wolves. Let's take a look at the clip and then talk. Okay.
So, uh, you know, one of the things I would imagine that would be uh, tricky in, in filming on a set like this is dealing with animals and, <laughs> you know, where, where you have something unpredictable that you can't right. really control. And, um, and then you have, you know, somebody like Kevin Costner riding a horse, which probably also adds to how unpredictable it could be. So, so could you tell us a little bit about what that would be like? On a, well, on set? Uh, to the first question, the, the buffalo sound that you hear in the movie, going back to one of Greg's earlier statements, is pretty much all post-production. Mm -hmm. One reason is because to the far side of the herd, they had pickup trucks keeping the herd moving in a straight line. And then behind the herd, they had a helicopter flying behind them to drive them in that direction. So pretty much all the sound I recorded on the set was Nick's. Okay, so that's all post. Uh, with Kevin, uh, luckily he doesn't have any lines of dialogue in the hunt, but he did fall off his horse. And I think if you get the DVD of the movie, it's in one of the extras where you actually see a, a Native American rider and he collide, he goes off the horse. But for the filmmakers, we thought the movie was over right there because if he had been seriously injured, that was it. He was a producer, he was a star, he was a director. Right, right. That'd have been the end of the film. Yeah, yeah and, and how, how fast were they, was he riding at full speed when he fell off? He was, he was going at a pretty good clip. I mean, he's, he's, he's a real athletic uh, person. I mean, even on Field of Dreams, he, he could routinely hit the ball mm -hmm. out into the corn. And, in that last shot in mm -hmm. Field of Dreams, as a matter of fact, the only reason we got any of those shots is that we had to bring water trucks in to Iowa to irrigate the cornfield because there was a drought right? in, in, in the summer of 88. So the corn would not have been high enough for the people to walk into it and disappear. Huh. So right. that actually changed the shooting schedule. Uh, Dances, on the other hand, that was probably the easiest location that I worked with because we were so far out in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. The Buffalo Ranch that we worked on uh, run by the Hauk family, yeah. 55,000 acres. So that wow. ranch is actually yeah. larger than D.C. city. But I think only about, and I'm doing this from memory, about okay. only about 2,000 buffalo or something in the, that they had there? At the time, we ran 5,000. 5,000, yeah. We ran 5,000. And you made it look like, you know, right, because if you look 100,000. Yeah, when you look but at there's the no CG in that, I should I Well, should there say. is one. Is there, there a there's CG no set? There's no CG, I think, in the running. But That's when they crawl about. over right. the hill and they see the herd, That's what I'm talking about. Right. they have CG in that, I, I, way out on the horizon. But actually, in the, the scene no. we saw with them coming all, over, no. and it's just, it's clever editing and it's tight right. stuff like that. And, and then, you know, when he kills the buffalo in front of the little boy, that's yeah. a combination of looking at a real buffalo running and then a mechanical buffalo that, that augers in, as pilots would say, at the last second. Right. Uh, no wireless mics used in that movie, pr primarily because of the costuming. Uh, you know, with the Native American dress, they had a lot of wood and feathers and things that were very noisy. And a lot of chest. And a lot of chest <laughs> exposed. Yeah. So it was kind of like hard to hire to wire in that sort right, of situation. Right, right, right. <laughs> but I didn't really need it because it was so quiet. We got overflown by one airplane in six months. Is that right? And it was a B-1 bomber only because we were out near the uh, Air Force Base in Rapid City. That's right. That's and that right. was it. I mean, no commercial flights, no private pilots looking, well, look at that, shooting a movie, none of that. Okay, well, here's, here's a, a question. Typically, as we, as we saw in this scene, you know, with all the, the yes. thousands of buffalo coming over the, uh, over the hill, where are you? when that scene's happening. As far behind camera as I could possibly be. <laughs> That's why the boom Did you feel danger? There. I mean, was there, well, was there a feeling the, of... We, 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 we had a safety meeting, and pretty much every day on that set, for uh, the, those of you who may not know what I'm talking about, anytime you're dealing with guns, you're dealing with animals that are dangerous. I mean, mm -hmm. because even without the buffalo, we had a wolf that... That's right. Yeah. And, and Two socks. Uh, two socks. Okay. So yeah. what would happen when the wolf was working, any of the female crew that we had could do their prep, do whatever they had to do prior to the shoot, then they put them in a van and took them off set. Hmm. Because a wolf, yeah, he's trained, yeah, he'll come when you call him, but he's still a wolf. Yeah. And they were in more danger than anybody else on the set. And I was like, wow. You know, so there's a safety meeting, and the safety meeting, they said, if these buffalo decide that they want to run towards you, you know, <laughs> we can't do anything about it. Is that right? So I basically said, well, I don't need to be that close to them to hear them. So <laughs> I got as far back behind camera as possible to still be in the state of South Dakota. Have you ever felt, uh, um, I don't want to be too dramatic, you know, okay. like your life was in danger, but, but I, have you ever really felt threatened on a set through um, circumstance? You were talking about animals, vehicles, weapons, things yeah, like most, that? Yeah, mostly when you're doing stunt shots. I was, I was on a shoot in Kenya where uh, I was working with an actor named Timothy Bottoms. Sure. And, and we were around 
uh, a mortar. Now, this is not a mortar that, that you would use in, in a war, but mm -hmm. this is what the stunt people call a mortar that creates an explosion. Oh, it's like a, like a coffee can yeah, it's or something like, a coffee like that, can. a little bit bigger. Right, yeah. and, and we had a, a, a stunt crew from Kenya and an American uh, assistant director, and uh, the mortar went off while Tim and I were standing maybe 10 feet from it. It shouldn't have gone off at all, <laughs> except in the shot. Uh, you know, a couple other things like that. Every time you, uh, a, a person says, the fire's not going to be that big, oh, then you start moving your equipment back further. Right, right. Know it's be Guaranteed. 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 Yeah, if you, if you know the special effects guys are going to really screw you, you know, that's when it's going to come. You know? the, the more vehement they are about, yeah, this will be fine. No problem. <laughs> yeah. Or, and then you see the paint peeling off of vehicles. It's okay. It's that's right. too close. Well, that's funny. As a sound mixer, you get to sit far away right. and send the boom operator close. Right, so. but, but then because I want to work with that boom operator again, <laughs> I so you know what? Put that mic on a C stand, and you come back here with me. I can get another Neumann. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, a person that knows where the frame line is, I can't find can't find them that often. You know, it's funny. There was a, there was a, a special effects guy we called Special Ed. Okay. Who was uh, <laughs> on one of our sets, and we we always knew that something big was coming if, if he would say, "Oh, it's just going to be a little pop." <laughs> How loud's it going to be? And as as a sound person, I knew that was my time to turn right. down my headphones. Right, 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 right. <laughs> it's going to be gonna much gonna bigger. Blow it it's off. It's going to be nuclear. Yes. Okay, well, there's so much more to come in our special of uh, Greatest Scene Ever with our special guest, Russell Williams. So we'll return and see more right after this. Oh, my God. Uh, it's very hard to say. I... The Greatest Scene Ever comes from Zulu, which is one of my favorite films. Just the part where he starts walking up to the door and it's a slow, great first-person shot, and it's really, really emotional. It's just creepy. There's all sorts of dead animals behind Norman Bates. Martin Sheen's character has a very intense, personal, like, interior monologue. I don't think anything had taken the wind out of my lungs like that uh, scene. It's horrifying, but at the same time electrifying and inspiring. It's enough to bring the hairs up on your spine. A great, great scene. A brilliant scene. It's the greatest scene. Welcome back to Greatest Scene Ever. We're joined on the set today by Professor Russell, Will Russell Williams. In the AU Film Department? Yeah. Oscar-winning filmmaker? Yeah. Uh, we're here to look at some scenes from Professor Williams' career, including the next one, which is a gritty film that tells the story of a dark mentorship between rookie cop and veteran cop in the inner city. And uh, it garnered a Best Actor Oscar, which is hard to say three times in a row, for its star Denzel Washington, Training Day. Let's take a quick look at Training Day, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Smiling, oh, they got two pair, eh? <laughs> Do you have a kind beast two pair, you fucking dumb truck? Serio? Serio, Hey, you're fucking <sighs> stupid, eh? Say, why don't you take your medication or something, Hoss? Seriously, eh? Yeah, I know I'm number one. See why we don't play for money, Hoss? Because of this vato, eh? And that's nice, eh? Let me see your cueta right there. What? You're gone, Holmes, and underneath your shirt. Let me see. That's all right. Hey, come on, man. What is it? Like a 380 stainless? Nine millimeter Beretta. Like, like, like this one here? Just like that one. Is that right? But see, here, here's where the problem comes into play. I seen this one. I want to see yours. Come on, I say I ain't gonna shoot nobody. <laughs> Can't no. Come on, let me check it out, eh? You know? Oh, try it. Ooh. Learn that in the academy or what? Yeah, man. What a neat little trick. This is nice, huh? Nice right here. Yeah. Fuck about to up with this, huh? You know? Hell yeah, huh? Yeah, <laughs> you know what you do is you aim. Kind of like that. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just playing with you, Doc. Yeah, right, I gotta go. Yo, Alonzo! You see that? Kick back and party, eh? You're not another for you. What are you talking about? Hey, white boy. You ask me, Hans. But that's just, of course, if you ask. I think Alonzo played you for a fool, Lester. Eh, Big time, Holmes. 
Hey, where are you going? Where are you going? What's your deal? tell you, I, I've had this discussion for years with, with a good friend of mine. We always break down movie scenes and stuff okay. like that. Um, Ethan Hawke, we were just talking during the break, and, and Russell was telling me you know, how great of a guy he is. Absolutely. Uh, he completely drives me crazy in this movie. Oh. <laughs> totally drives me crazy. He's completely miscast in this movie. I don't know what it is, his hangdog look or something like that. He's the guy I would absolutely want to hang out with. But, right, right. But uh, you know, I'm, I was so glad to hear you during the break tell me what a cool guy he is. Because yeah, he's, he's very cool. And, and to me, I think the reason why he was cast was because he was so vulnerable. I mean, he was so just, oh, I just want to be an LAPD, you know, detective. Right, sure. And then when he really finds out what that means in Alonzo's eye, which is uh, Denzel's character, yeah. he finds out, well, maybe I don't want to be an LAPD. Or, you you know. know, and he does do that kind of vacant, kind right. of yeah. needy kind of thing fairly well. But anyway, I just, I need a full disclosure, I had to purge. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, Paul. You and um, <laughs> and um, something that's in this scene and, and some of the other scenes, you know, the, the guys who play, you know, the, the guys on the street are extremely convincing. And, um, well, there, there's a reason, Paul. Now, in this particular scene, there's only one gentleman, I think the bald head gentleman, actually was incarcerated. And then they have a thing called the L.A. Streetlights program, which actually brings folks into the movie business, but as PAs and things like that. And I think our director spotted this guy and put him in the scene. In the ending scene, in the big climactic scene where mm -hmm. uh, Ethan's character actually shoots Denzel, mm -hmm. all those guys standing around on the street were real gangbangers. And for us to actually operate in some of these areas in L.A., East L.A. is where this scene was shot. Uh -huh. We had to get permission from the East L.A. gangs. And when we went to the black gang areas, we had mm -hmm. to get permission there. And it, it, it was very tense you know, some nights, because a lot of that stuff we shot at night. And since the movie takes place in a 24-hour period, once it got dark, then that meant that pretty much every weapon you saw probably had some ammo in it. <laughs> <laughs> and the prop people weren't in charge of them. Well, I was going to say, you know, cutting the location deal must have been, you know, quite a challenge for, for some of those locations. But at least, you know, I, I imagine the, the uh, security was great. The security is <laughs> great, and, and a lot of times it's because you had... The, the professional security, and then you had the neighborhood folks who knew who was who in the neighborhood. They said, no, you got to watch out for this guy. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. Right, right, right. Yeah. Did you have anything happen on set where something vanished or anything like that? Uh, the funniest thing, not, not actually at the camera, mm -hmm. but at base camp is where we stage all of our uh, vehicles, and we usually have police standing right there. Sure. We had four cars, what they call the picture cars, and you see two of them in the movie, one where Denzel has the hydraulics and another right. one where they just ride around. Well, the one that didn't have the hydraulics just kind of walked away with a L.A. police officer maybe 10 feet from it because <laughs> a, a, very, a very, you know, uh, I would say alert kid said, hey, you know, they need this back over on the set. And the w policeman waved him off. And then when the transportation captain came back later, he said, well, where's the car? I said, oh, no, somebody brought it to the set an hour ago. Somebody who? <laughs> they got the car I'll back eventually, but, you know, That's fine. right under their nose. Okay, we've got to go to break soon, but uh, uh, before we do it, we've okay. got, uh, how much time do we have? Like about two minutes, something like that? Three minutes? Great. I want to uh, throw a, a, a tangent, a, a okay. curveball. And that is, you know, uh, we all remember, uh, those of us who, who work uh, in film, we remember the greatest shot or remember the greatest sound we recorded or the greatest, you know, picture we took or something like that. What's the greatest sound you never recorded? that you always wanted to record that you couldn't get on tape for one reason or another? The greatest sound I never recorded. Yeah. That's a tough one. I could probably think of some greatest actors I haven't had a chance to work with. Well, the greatest sound work too. I haven't recorded. Well, let, let me go with actors initially. Uh, Gene Hackman I haven't had a chance to work with. Mm -hmm. Dustin Hoffman. Uh, and the gentleman who inspired me to get in the business in the first place was a guy named Sidney Poitier. Oh, sure. You know, um, but the greatest sound, I would probably say the space shuttle. Yeah? Yeah. Now, what about the space shuttle specifically? Well, You're I talking mean, about just like a close-up mic or... I mean, How would just, you record the space shuttle? Well, I mean, it just looks like it's a nightmare because A, how far back would you have to be from the space shuttle so the microphone itself doesn't melt? And with all of those millions of tons of sound energy, 
you know, I mean, how much would you have to pad it? I noticed that even when you look at the, the launch, they're dumping millions of gallons of water on the launch pad for some reason. I assume that's to either cool it off or break up the sound. It's I mean, to break up the sound. Most, people, the sound. most okay. people think it's actually to, to, to cool it, but it's not. Okay. It's, it's because without that pool of water down there, the whole structure would just vibrate to pieces. Sounds, sounds so, like an earthquake in L.A. It is. Uh. <laughs> it's sound dampening. It's exactly right. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. So, uh, so now we've got the, the, the greatest sound you've never recorded. What, what do you think is the greatest sound or maybe your top three of, of the greatest sound you have recorded? And I know accuracy is sort of funny because, you know, yeah. you, you really do think of it two different ways. You know, right. actors that you record and stuff right. like that. But then there's this whole other world. Like you mentioned the space shuttle, you know, the challenges of recording something like that or the perfect gunshot right. or the perfect you know, well, buffalo or something. We'll say like from some of the stuff that we looked at today, say for instance, uh, in some of the night scenes in Field of Dreams, the reason why they sound so convincing is because I spent a lot of nights out there at the mm -hmm. farm just with a tape recorder running and stereo mics kind of eight feet up in the air and just recording the night music. Uh, two actors in that movie, which uh, we didn't see in this particular clip, but working with James Earl Jones and then even older, working with Burt Lancaster. Yeah. I mean, I remember seeing him in movies when I would go to the movies with my parents and sure. I was saying, I'm working with Burt Lancaster. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's pretty cool. I mean, it, it was That's really cool. That's pretty cool. Um, uh, some of the other stuff, I don't know if it would interest the audience, but just tricks that you have to do. You have to hide mics in places that nobody would, mm -hmm. you know, but if the actor hits their mark and they don't blow the line, and, and it all the whole point of it is, is even though you may have seven mics working, it's supposed to just sound like one mic did everything, mm -hmm. even though physically it would be impossible. And, you know, some of that is in glory, some of that is in training day, some of that is in a film called Rules of Engagement, mm -hmm. where I okay. had to hide mics, you know, people on the phone, people over here, you know. Um, it's, you know, a lot of stuff. I think Billy Freakin probably used a shot that I never expected to make the final, which was when Sam Jackson brings the flag back to uh, Ben Kingsley in the helicopter. Mm -hmm. That's off of a radio mic. They didn't do any posts. Is he wouldn't right? let yeah. them post it. He wouldn't let them ADR it. So that's huh. really what it sounds like with the blade spinning on top of your head on a real helicopter right before they take off. And I was like, okay, yeah. Billy, you're the man. How you doing? <laughs> so reverse Vic Morrow. Right, right, right exactly. Yeah. Well, there's much more greatest scene to come, so stay with us. Very early in the movie Glory, there's a scene of Union soldiers playing baseball. The Civil War had a significant role in the rapid growth of the sport as it became a popular pastime for soldiers on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. In Dances with Wolves, Two Socks was played by two wolves. One was called Buck and the other was called Teddy, and both were kept on the set at all times. And in Field of Dreams, as Russell mentioned earlier, Northeast Iowa was in the middle of a drought and the cornfields surrounding the diamond had to be given lots of extra water in order to grow tall enough for the actors to disappear into the stalks. As a result, the corn grew too fast and too tall. In the one scene where the corn is above Costner's shoulders, he's walking on an elevated plank. Welcome back to Greatest Scene Ever. Um, we're here with Russell Williams, um, uh, film professor in, at AU. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Paul, you know, uh, it's, it's time to uh, turn the tables on our guest here. Uh -oh. we, 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 we're not totally surprising. We did talk during the break about this, but we're going to put the question to you. Uh, I just asked you about the greatest sounds and stuff, but our show is Greatest Scene Ever. So, Russell, Greatest Scene Ever, tell us what it is, and uh, after we see the clip, we're going to ask you to defend your choice, to give us the why. Okay. Uh, the one that I like, especially for the context of this show, is the beach scene, the opening scenes from Saving Private Ryan. Excellent. Let's take a look, shall we?
opportunity. One man to waste the ammo. Stand out of your weapon. Keep those actions clear. We'll see you on the beach. Very cool. Great scene. Great scene or the greatest scene? Tell us why. Well, I wanted to pick a scene that you could basically feel the impact of it without seeing it in the context of the full film. Okay, good. A lot of other scenes I could pick, you know, but you would have to have the context of the movie to set it up. Right. This one, I don't think you really need the context of the movie. This is pretty much how the film opens. Uh, I think a lot of us have this John Wayne heroic, nobody got hurt in World War II image of those contests and once you see this scene I don't think anyone and including the people on the hill or the people in the White House they should watch this scene anytime they decide that they're going to send someone else's children into good battle because this is what they're looking at yeah good you know, point good point uh, the way it was shot the way the sound uh, there's no music it just really put yourself in the position of one of these men and see could you have gotten through that that morning mm -hmm. You know, I, I just think it's a fantastic piece of filmmaking. Yeah. And one of the things I really like about it, Paul, as well, and Russell, is I love the uh, the, the attention to detail mm -hmm. in, in the soundtrack. Um, yes. It's kind of a sound recordist dream, as we were sort of talking about earlier during the break, where you hear the tink of the bullet, tink, 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 as the bullets hit those, those you know, things that are like this, which are you right. know, meant to thwart the boats as they came in at, yes. at, at low tide and uh, at, or keep also vehicles rolling up on the beach. and. Um, and, and the sound, you know, what would a bullet sound like if it hit somebody underwater? You know, there was a there right. was great thought that was put into it and great care. It's, it's really a, just a, a wonderful piece of filmmaking. Yeah, you're right, yeah. yeah and um, I, I think, I know something we've talked about before um, when you talk about um, the, the movie Heat mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. is really understanding the environment you're in and understanding how sound reacts to that environment. Absolutely. And um, I think this scene does that well, but you know, also in Heat, I know when we've sp spoken about the, the gunshots in that movie. Um, yeah, and and uh, I was, I, I told that mixer, Lee Orloff, mm -hmm. I, I told him I think I jinxed him because I saw that, I saw Heat, I think it was 1995, saw it at Man's Chinese, uh -huh. and I came out of there and I called him immediately. I said, man, you better get your speech ready. Because <laughs> it was one of the best mixes I had heard. Uh, and part of the reason was because he would put microphones 25, 50, and 100 yards from camera. So you get all that back slap of the guns off the buildings. Yeah. And, and, and Michael Mann 
told the post-production people, I want that sound. I don't want you to clean it up and make it sound really nice. That's what an assault rifle sounds like on a city street, and that's what makes the innocent bystanders die for the concrete. <laughs> right. You know? The last sound that they hear, you know. Right. But that's a really good point, actually, which is something that, you know, I talk about to my students in my, my uh, film sound classes or just regular film classes, is the s certain sounds <coughs> are done um, uh, in post-production to make us, uh, to, to sound like what we expect to hear. Correct. Like when we recreate the sound of horses' hooves, sometimes yes. we really will get out the coconuts. I've got, I've got the coconuts, and I'll bring them into the set. We'll put them up here on the shelf. Um, and gunshots, are especially, because mm -hmm. anyone who's ever heard a real gun, it's a very uninteresting sound. It's a, you know, kind of a thing like right, that. Right. But what do we hear? You know, from exactly. kind of thing like right, that. Right. You know? Right. And so, uh, you know, when you're on set and you're recording weapons like that, I mean. Uh, there, there must be a challenge. I mean, talk to me about the challenge of getting a good, well, clean gun shot. Well, say when we were doing something like Glory or, or dances, those period pieces have kind of like a two-step, you know, you have the actual hammer hitting mm -hmm. the flint and then you actually have the, the powder blowing mm -hmm. up. So I realize that all the gunshots pretty much that I record on set are going to be replaced, but I still try to get as much of the other little detail of handling the weapon and mm -hmm. try to get it is uh, what we would do basically if we had the Confederate soldiers on camera, I'd take Union soldiers behind camera a hundred yards and get some stuff with them. Okay. You know, no, uh, that's good to try to get them clean. Good tricks of the trade. Okay, um, I, I want to do something special here in the program. I'm going to pull down our fake Oscar <laughs> here <coughs> because we're, we're going to um, 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 mention, as we have before, that you've been honored with uh, Oscars for your contribution in American cinema. And some notable actors have some inst interesting places to keep their Oscars. I did a little research. Jack Nicholson is rumored to keep one of his three Oscars as a hat stand. <laughs> Morgan Freeman tells this story. When my house was being built, one of the guys who was doing the finishing work said he wanted to construct a trophy cabinet for me. And he put an acrylic sign on the top of the shelf that said, no parking, Oscar only. Okay. <laughs> as the story goes, so when I won, Freeman says, I took down the sign and put the Oscar in his place. And Russell, Russell Crowe reportedly keeps his in a chicken coop in his ranch in Australia. He says it's inspired his hens to lay larger eggs. So you get the Oscar, you attend the parties, you wake up the next morning. What do you do with the eight and a half pound statuette? Well, in an effort... To help you, Russell, Greatest Scene Ever presents the top 10 things to do with your Oscar. Number 10, where does a lapel pin to get great tables and restaurants? <laughs> Number 9, keep in the car trunk and throw it under the tire for traction in the snow. Okay. Number 8, two Oscars, one word, bookends. Okay. okay? Yeah. That's, that's yeah. for you specifically. Number 7, makes a classy Ken for a very lucky Barbie. <laughs> Number 6, quickie hammer for a crooked picture. <laughs> Number five, works better than a jacket to hold a movie theater seat. You're just going to put it in your seat like that. Um, number four, door knocker adds value to your house. Okay, consider that if you will. Okay. Number three, one for the city, one for the vacation home. Um, okay, that's better. Number two, meltdown for new grill work. That could be very, uh, very cool for you. Yeah, not my generation. And the number one uh, use for using your Oscar Russell, use it to wax smart Alex students in your film class. Okay, very good. Now comes they the may line up for that one. Yeah, there you go. One we'll for each put, hand. We'll put a fake Oscar here. Like, well, on behalf of the uh, greatest scene ever. Okay. Uh, so now comes the hardest part of every show when we run out of time. We want to thank Russell Williams here for uh, being here today and sharing his thoughts on films and film history. And uh, don't forget to check out um, Russell's films uh, at the Bender Library. But there. not more money. Not they're, Mo they're time, they're time <laughs> well worth spent. I mean, we're going to have to hear that, that Mo Money story. There's oh, a story yeah. in there someplace. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and check out our new website. You'll find facts about the films we discussed today, as other information about the show, and links related to film articles and text. The address is on your screen now. And that's where you can also send us your comments, your criticism, corrections, and trivia answers. Just click on the email link on the website, and we're also on Facebook. Uh, just type in greatest scene ever as one long word. And thank you to uh, Sarah Mankey Fish, mm -hmm. our priestess of cinematic trivia, <laughs> our unflappable uh, crew, and everyone else who helped out, especially with the set this week. With the set this week. Thank you so much to everyone who helped out with the set this week. So we will um, um, see you next time on Greatest Scene Ever, and we want you now to all go out and do something great today. Thanks for coming. <laughs>